Before we begin, three messages. Here's a riddle. How do you build native cross-platform mobile applications quickly without having to rewrite code and hire consultants at a huge cost? Titanium from AppCelerator. Called the easy button for mobile application development, it allows you to focus more on what's important, getting product out the door. Join the more than 1.5 million active developers who have created over 13,000 apps at www.accelerator.com. So, you've taken some of the advice that has come from untethered.tv guests, built an app, and now you're turning your attention to generating some hard-earned revenue. Then you should be looking at Pontiflex app leads. Some of your peers who are using app leads are earning CPMs 100 times the industry average. And if you need any other reasons to start, I'll give you two more. You can run sign-up ads from top brands, the ones that you recognize, and it won't take your precious users out of your app. Go to appleads.com, that's A-P-P-L-E-A-D-S.com to sign up. When my company needed to develop a key mobile product, one that I was counting on as a new source of revenue, I knew exactly who to turn to, Macadamian. They delivered on time with incredible attention to detail, and I was able to get product into customers' hands faster than I ever thought possible. I've personally known them for 10 years, and they do make great products even better. Check them out at www.macadamian.com. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Untethered.tv. My name is Rob Woodbridge. I'm your host as we take a tour down through some of the most amazing and innovative mobile companies and where we meet their founders, co-founders, and uh, visionaries that are in this in this space. And I'm joined today from uh, somebody in New York City, uh, Vic Singh, who is the uh, founder and CEO of a company called Trax. And this was a uh, recently a TechCrunch uh, Disrupt uh, featured company. Uh, Vic is also the, the co-founding partner of uh, ENIAC Ventures, which is a uh, venture capital firm in New York City. And I would say, well, I was growing up, uh, there was a television show called The King of Kensington. And uh, I look at Vic and I look at what he's done and the, and the people that he's touched and the companies that he's touched, uh, not only through Tracks but through ENIAC. And uh, I would say that he's, uh, you know, the, the king of New York City. Uh, when it comes to uh, a hub and spoke activity, when it comes to bringing these companies up together, uh, some of the companies that uh, that um, Vic has been involved with are Fast Society and, and uh, Nearverse. Uh, these two companies that uh, I've had on uh, previously on on Tether TV, and we're here to talk about Tracks, um, which is a very interesting application, and I'll get uh, Vic to uh, to go through it. Vic, man, thank you for coming on, joining us, telling the story on Tether TV. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you for having me, Rob, and thanks for the. Uh very complimentary intro. I don't think I deserve any of that, but <laughs> wow. happy to, to be on here and, and talk about what we're doing. Well, so why don't we start there? Uh, you, you've just come back from, uh, well, you haven't come back anywhere. I mean, it was in New York City, but TechCrunch Disrupt, um, you, you were involved in that uh, for your latest company where you're the CEO, um, which founder and CEO, which is called Trax. Why don't we just start there? We'll get, we'll get an understanding of what Trax is. Sure. Yeah. No, so, so I guess, first of all, I want to thank the TechCrunch guys, it was an amazing launch, an amazing opportunity for the company. Um, Trax is a social storytelling service for the mobile generation. So uh, the concept is called a track, right? So a track is any story that you want to tell through photos that you make with your friends. These stories can be finite or they can continue forever. So, uh, you know, you could have a track for your weekend in the Hamptons, a track for girls' night out, a track for the wedding. Or you could just have a continuous track for cool things I see on my way to work. Hmm. And these stories are created on a mobile application with others. And then we automatically publish them to the web in a beautiful layout. And we also save the high quality photos. So if you really want to immortalize that moment, you can actually print a magazine of your tracks. So it's a sort of end-to-end -end social storytelling service through photos that starts with mobile, takes it to the web, and then brings it back offline into a printed form. So, uh, I mean, it seems like this is a, um, a very logical approach. So if I'm on, if I'm on a trip with somebody, um, or I, I take photos, they take photos, it ends up in the same stream. It's kind of like, uh, I, I know Leo Laporte did this with uh, Posturus a number of years ago with all the conferences. They just shared a Posturus stream and all the posts were in one stream so that they could actually watch what was going on at a conference and their involvement in the conference. 
you're taking this right. up just to a photo level, which is basically any photo that I take that I tag with that stream and any photo that somebody was with me that tags, it, it, it combines this into a beautiful uh, uh, reminder, memento of, of whatever it is that you're doing. Is that exactly, exactly. I mean, the idea is that, you know, the mobile camera phone has sort of replaced the digital camera for all intents and purposes. Yes, it is. But we're snapping so many photos at the same event or with the same experience. So why not have that together in one place, in a private place, actually, that you could then sort of relive and share later? There are a lot of companies that take a web-centric approach to it. So after an experience has happened, you go online, and then you kind of collaborate together, and you put together this photo album that's group-based. But that's more sort of like a project management approach. What Trax is saying is, as the experience is happening, invite people into that track, collaborate together, and really tell that story, and then it automatically goes to the web. We're mobile first and web afterwards, and, and everything starts on mobile, and that's you know, kind of how we're, how we're approaching it. There are a lot of other you know, sort of bigger ideas in here, but we wanted to launch something just very simple that really solves a basic problem, right? You're at a wedding. The bride and groom, you know, are like exhausted because everyone's snapping the same exact photo of them. <laughs> yes. So why have everyone line up to get the same exact photo? You could just put that one beautiful photo in a track yeah. and then collect all the different points of view from that occasion or that experience into one track. So that's kind of, you know, the simplistic approach we're taking. Hey, hey, so we're going to spend the majority of the time on tracks, but I've got to, I've got to take a little bit of a step back and understand you know the evolution and as to how how this came about. Um, you know, it, it's you launched at TechCrunch Disrupt, which was last week. Yeah. So you're you're kind of prepubescent, two weeks old kind of thing. Um, yeah. You know, walk us back into uh, take us back to why start this company. Was there just a big void, or, or what were you seeing in the marketplace that really lent this to you know uh, came up why you came up with this idea? Well, so it's, it's kind of been an interesting voyage, right? So the tracks that we started in September is different than the tracks that we launched at Disrupt. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's a good thing. So the idea that we started with in September, we teamed up with AppFund, which is sort of an incubator here in New York for mobile startups. Mm -hmm. They're kind of like a beta works for mobile. And we got together and I came with this idea of the whole notion of geoblogging and taking photos and really telling a story through a geoblog, right? Yeah. So the idea was, if you look at tweets happening in Hell's Kitchen, those tweets really don't have the Hell's Kitchen context to them. They're just kind of people tweeting about world affairs, but they happen to be sitting in Hell's Kitchen. Mm -hmm. So I saw this sort of, you know, uh, like a, a disconnect between geoblogging and what the, and what the geo locale is really saying. So I said, well, let's create this, this sort of uh, application, and we call it Tracks, that allows you to actually do geoblogging with rich media that really tells the story of your environment. And that's where we started. And then it kind of it started taking on a life of its own, and then a track became sort of a full-on story. And then we went into private beta with our mobile application in February, and people started saying, hey, I really like this, so I can create a track for anything. It could be a weekend getaway, it could be the color blue, it could be New York City views, it could be anything I want, and then I could put this out there in the public, and then people can take that, and then they could create their own tracks. You could have a track for Soho shopping, a track for art downtown. But the one thing that everyone said was, I want to do a track with someone else. I want to really not just do it by myself. So then we said, that's definitely on the roadmap, and our user said, no, we want that now. <laughs> we're like, okay, I guess we have to listen to our users. So we kind of took a step back and we we're like, okay, we built this really beautiful architected application which has nearby discovery, it has geoblogging, it has a notion of subscriptions. We're building an interest network on top of it where you subscribe to a track and not a person. And it was very cool, but it just felt very heavy. Mm -hmm. So then we said, you know what, let's listen to our users and they wanted to collaborate on these tracks. Let's, let's build collaboration. And once we started to build collaboration, the product just got really, really simple. Like, it just happened sort of magically. We're like, oh my God, we don't need this, we don't need that. And we just trimmed and trimmed and trimmed. And we launched with this MVP, which was all about collaboration. Still had the core notion of geo in there, and also the core notion of storytelling, but really stories that you make together. So it was kind of this, this interesting six-month journey to really find who, who we are and 
this is who we are, and here we are today. Vic, I mean, it's so uh, it's so interesting though that uh, you end up uh, simplifying things based on what what simplifying the the application based on what what your users were telling you or your beta users were telling you. I mean, uh, when you were building the product, when you started building the product, you build your you know product roadmap or your product plan six months ago, and you start implementing it. Was that was that you and your and your team kind of coming up with this is what we think it, we, we this should be or this is where the yeah. holes are in the market? We kind of started with what we think, and yeah. then but but a little before that, we wanted to test it out. So we ran some consumer focus groups. We said you know we had a bunch of people that we just got from like Craigslist, and we we're like we'll give you you know free beer and pizza if you like <laughs> come over and tell us what you think. So we're you know, the first group we're like okay, what if? You had idea number one, you know. And what if idea number one had X, Y, Z in it? Yep. What would you like? What wouldn't you like? And we did that a few iterations, and then we started building. And but we started building. We started building really fast, and we're like, okay, let's stop again, and let's actually start talking to people again. And then when we started to talk to people in Randy's focus groups, which an act, with an actual prototype, then it started to get really informed and really get better. And then when the polished product, the first polished product, was done. That's when we opened it up to private beta and we invited about 100 people in it. We actually, there was a two-week period where we brought in people to the office every day and it was just one-on-one -on -one sessions. Come they would on. sit with me and my designer and we would sit down with them like, go through the, the entire app. You know, does that button work? You, or you can't find a login screen or you don't know where to enter your text. It was like very detailed and we hammered that out. We had like 25 people come to the office in the course of two weeks to just, you know, accomplish two things kill the UX, make it amazing, um, and then also to interview them on use cases. How would you use this thing? And then from that, we went back to drawing board again and then kept polishing and polishing and polishing, put it back again in private beta, and that's when collaboration started to come up. And then we went back again and then <laughs> collaboration, and then we launched a Disrupt. So this, I mean, it's a lot of insider sort of sausage making I'm giving you here, but that was, that was the path. Well, uh, I mean, it's such a... Uh, uh, I mean, this is this is meat. This is great because when you start to talk about building a product in the mobile space, uh, you're ultimately uh, going on your own thoughts first, and then. Uh, but that's a lot of effort. So you bring in 25 people over a period of time to test, to basically hammer the UI, hammer the the functionality, um, and you're willing at that point to take in all of that feedback, look at the product and see where they don't fit, and then go back in you and redesign to. the product. Yeah, and, and it's tough, right? It's tough to let go of hard work. You also have to be very careful around the feedback that you do take and the ones you don't, right? So, so some how do you know that? How do you know what to listen to? It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but you also look at the profile of the person, right? So some power users are like, I want this, this, that, and that. And then you take a look back, you're like, okay, he's one of my tech friends in New York. Yeah. Like, he can learn like that. But if I give it to someone else who, you know, who has no idea what's going on, you know, you, you kind of take what they have and then you kind of find a way in the middle. And we actually, we segmented it even further, right? We had four groups. We had, and it was kind of weird, we had people we knew who didn't know what Trax was. Then we had people we knew who knew what Trax was. And then we had the same thing for people who we didn't know. Okay. So we had four segments of people, half of them who didn't know anything, half of them who knew everything. And then amongst those four groups, half of them who knew us, half of them who didn't know us. And, you know, we try to be as scientific as possible, but at the end of the day, you take everything you have, you kind of, you know, you go with your gut as well, and you go, and you go back to the drawing board, and you just keep iterating and iterating until you think you have something amazing. And I think we're close to having something really amazing, but I know we have something very special right now. Yeah, I mean, I love, I love that whole process that you just went through. I know that there was a, a study that was just released by Jacob Nielsen, who is this uh, usability guru uh, in, in the web space. Uh, you know, I remember reading Jacob's books, and... And uh, they came out with a comprehensive study where they, they handed, uh, you know, a number of apps, prescripted apps like Flipboard or the NPR app on, a, mm -hmm. on an iPad to 16 random people, 16 right. random people. And they came back and said, you know what? They don't know how to use these apps, huh. right? That was, the, that was the summary is that people don't know how to use these apps. Flipboard. Wow. Right? That's amazing. Flipboard. Yeah. Um, I mean, the lessons learned there are uh, 16 does not make a comprehensive study, and you've just done 25 for a single product to reiterate yeah. plus for a single two beta product. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, that, and then we also did, you know, sort of the 
you know, the McKinsey style <laughs> surveys and whatnot, yeah. right? Like trying to break down our demographics and figuring out their usage patterns based on devices, how many photos they take, you know, where they live, like all these different things. Those are good to kind of test the waters, but nothing is as helpful as just bringing people in and getting that face-to-face -face feedback. It's really, really important. I love it. And, and so the, the product that you, you launched at uh, Disrupt last week was a far cry. Same kind of space, but a far cry from where you started, where the original vision yeah. was. Yeah, it was. It's, it's the same space and the same concept, but a very different product in terms of um, its feature set, its use cases, uh, its privacy controls, uh, its broadcasting or not broadcasting ability. Just sort of everything really changed about it for the better, yeah. because it wasn't you know it wasn't a vacuous process. It was it was working with our users to build something really amazing for them. I mean, you've seen the evolution of the industry, especially in the photograph and the uh, uh, mobile photograph space over the last six months. I mean, yeah. you've, you've been able to build and watch, keep an eye on what's going on because yeah. it's exploded in the last six months. It has. It has. When we when we first prototype tracks, we were on our way and an Instagram launch. We were yeah. like, oh, wow, I love that service. <laughs> and then we thought we we're like, oh, no, here comes, here yeah. comes, the, yeah. you know, all the photo sharing folks, but the stance that I always take as a, as a CEO, startup CEO, is we, we can't operate on the defensive. You know, we have to be mindful of what's out there, but we can't build for the competition. Always build for the, for the customer and the consumer. Yeah. And that's, what, that's our mantra at Trax, and I think it's going to pay off well. What do you think it was? I mean, just stepping out and looking at the industry for a second, uh, you know, it, it seems like there's a pendulum that swings, and, you know, it, it'll swing to one side, and it'll be like, uh, you know, group chat yeah. and everybody, you know, all of a sudden there's like 50 different group chat apps and, and they don't just materialize, you know, they would have gone through six or nine months of development, but they all yeah. landed at the same time. And then, yeah. you, you know, then it just kind of swings and it's like photographs. And then it's like all of a sudden, uh, you know, there's, you know, two dozen or three dozen uh, photograph um, applications right. that arrive. What is it about this, this industry that, that people kind of just, you know, they end up launching almost at the same time with uh, in a product in the same space. Not the same product, but in the same space. Yeah. Any, I've been trying insight? to figure that. I've been trying to figure that out for a while. It's it's really hard. I mean, in my last startup at Nearverse, we had the same thing. It's I think we all just like read the same articles, and you know, we're all in the same circle, even if we don't know each other. Yeah. We're all talking about the next big thing and, and the newest thing, and it just kind of happens. I mean, it, it happens globally, right? It's yeah. like, you know, there, there are competitors for every space and it, it just kind of props up and happens. And I, I really do think it's because the people who are building these companies are so like in tune and, and so aware and so consumed by the entire space that we just like, we know, we kind of feel what's going to happen next and we just build it. And I mean, it all comes out at the same time and who knows who's going to win or who, what share you're going to take. So, well, I mean, there's always it, it's a big enough market, right, uh, for a lot of the, for a lot of you guys to win. Uh, you know, yeah, you, you don't yeah, need exactly, a dominant winner. Exactly. Um, exactly. Like I cut up our market very very tightly, and I, I I see a lot of greenfield opportunity for tracks that isn't really untapped is, isn't really tapped today. So, yeah, and and I think that that's that's interesting. What you did is that you you. Um, you, you allow some of your customers, and I know that you have to temper, you know, as you said, you have to make sure that you listen, but maybe not implement everything that your, your customers or your users uh, ask for, uh, because ultimately you are leading them. They, they're pointing you, but you're going to lead them in a direction. Exactly, exactly. And also, I mean, there are a lot of sort of takeaways, right? You, you want to build for your customer, but sometimes that may not be the customer you want. Right. So, so if it, if you're building something and this person wants it, but you really don't want that market, then you have to rethink your whole thing as well. So it really is iteration, learning, and just figuring it out. It, you know, and you you should be as scientific as you could possibly be with this because it feels like like entrepreneurship is an art, and it is, but it's a t it's a ton of sweat and a ton of science. And if you if you take a rigorous approach, you're going to be in good shape. Is that is that kind of mean like you know one of the things that entrepreneurs do is that they 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 get emotionally attached to an idea, and uh, they follow yeah. that idea you know until they fall off a cliff or succeed right and um, so you know it's been described to me and I'm an entrepreneur and I've been doing it for a long time and 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, I fall in love with my companies, right? Yeah. I, get I fall in love with them. You know, it's what yeah, gets me up in the morning. Yeah. But you have to be able to balance that, right? That love for the company, as you're saying, with a scientific approach that says, look, you might love it, but that idea stinks. We got to modify it. And you guys were able to do that over the last six months. How, yeah. How can, you, I mean, how can you balance that? It was, I mean, to be honest, Rob, it was hard for us, you know, because what we built, we loved as well. But, you know, we just had a gut check as a team and said, hey, this is what we're going to do. And let's, uh, let's move forward, right? It's, 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 a, it's not easy. It's not easy. I could, I, could talk, I, you know, I could talk all day long about the science behind it, but it really is emotional because you've worked blood, sweat, and tears to get to one product and you realize that product should change into something else and you have to you know, be ready for another sprint. And it's all about just being really good with your team and being as open as possible and everyone just going after the same thing. There's, it'll be impossible to get to where it is if you're not all on the same page and doing it together. I mean, Trax is a team of three and a designer. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. So it's, you know, to me, it's Trevor Kyra, who's my co-founder and head of engineering, um, and then our iPhone developer. He actually taught himself the iPhone uh, on his own, and then we have a designer. So we're a very small team, but because, of, because we're small, we're able to iterate really fast as well. Um, but, hey, I still have that, the uh, old version of Trax on my phone, and, you know, check it out every now and again. <laughs> so you still use that one. Is that it? <laughs> Uh, it's funny. So uh, here's a, here's a, here's a question. Vicky. When you use that old version and you use the new version, yeah. I mean, do you, do you, are you still emotionally attached? I, I still, I still have a lot. Of, I mean, sometimes I'm, uh, I, you know, I think to myself, let's just put the old version in the app and the store and call it something else. <laughs> you just never know. Right. Um, yeah. But you got to move on. You just got to move on. It, it's hard to know though. If, if we did put it in the store, it might have been a wild success, right? But based on our, our data and our feedback and everything we've been through and knowing our market really well, I think we made the right decision for sure. So, uh, well, yeah, I, I mean, and I think that that's evident uh, with the response that, uh, that you received after uh, Disrupt. And uh, I mean, did it, by, by going through that process, um, did it delay your launch? No, I think I think it was an amazing forcing function for us um, because you know there was a date. I mean, we always have our launch dates in mm -hmm. the startup world, yeah. but it, but you know, two thousand people aren't going to be you know in a room kind of waiting for you to launch, right? <laughs> They're not so at the door waiting for you to unlock it. Yeah, exactly. You know, your your logo isn't going to be printed on a publication that the world is going to see. So it was it was a great forcing function and. You know, it was one of the biggest sprints of the company's life. And now, you know, I just uh, came back from our weekend and, and, at Memorial Day and really feel refreshed for like the next phase of this company's life. Um, but it, it was the best thing that, 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 that could ever happen to us. So, so talk about that process, because, you know, one of the one of the biggest challenges for any mobile application today is to rise above the noise uh, because it's so it's right. there are so many uh, just iOS. I mean, <coughs> You know, five hundred thousand apps is a is a uh, is a torrent, and um, so uh, you you guys launched a disrupt. You applied at, to to do this. You went through that whole process. Um, yeah. Why do you think they selected you over you know many others? I'm sure that were. I mean, there's thousands that apply, and uh, yeah. and there's only a handful that get in there. Why why do you think that they selected you guys? Yeah. So they, I mean, I think the numbers were you know a thousand applications. Yeah. And thirty were selected so you know like three percent or whatnot That's I think I think they wanted to have companies that you know are a good representation in New York um, that were pre-launch in New York yep. and I think that's big and they wanted you know companies that are cutting edge and mobile I think the approach that we took sort of this whole um, very simplistic mobile to web to print and the concept of a track really resonated with the guys at Disrupt because they kind of see it a, a lot more public, right? So a track can be any blogger in Soho can write a track about anything or create a track about anything and tell that story. Mm -hmm. So they see like the vision of a very big disruptive storytelling platform that would be born out of something, you know, as, as simple as, as our app. Uh, and they bought into that vision and, um, and they thought it was really cool. So... We we're happy that they selected us. We went through, you know, a process with them, like all the other companies, where you 
put your application in, and then you do a Skype interview, and then you in person one, and then they make their selections, and you do a bunch of rehearsals, and then you're ready to go. So, how uh, just just out of curiosity, how important? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, let me frame this question. I, I I know a lot of companies who have ended up in uh, Mashable or t on TechCrunch's front page when they launch, and and they kind of see like a you know that startup. Uh, there's the startup curve, which is straight up yeah. when they're on TechCrunch, and then the next day it's like straight down. It's like yeah. uh, there's no in between. Uh, so, how important was TechCrunch Disrupt for your launch? Like, and and um, you know, do you anticipate that there's just going to be sustained interest as a result of that? Yeah, yeah. So I forget who tweeted this out, but it was a few weeks ago, and he said, "Startups don't spend too much time worried about your launch." That's when it begins, yeah. you know, and he's totally right. Um, I think it was great for, the, for one, a forcing function for us, yep. and two, the visibility. So Prax is finally out of the closet. You know, a lot of my friends have been asking me for months, what the hell are you working on? What is this Trax thing? You'd see a random tweet about it every now and again. So it's good to just be out there, and it was a great sort of a, of, of, of a launching pad for us to do that, um, and it was a great forcing function. But the approach that I took was, this is just the beginning. This is a marathon. This isn't a sprint. And I'm not looking for a million users in one week. I'm looking to make sure that the mechanics of my viral loop are working, that customer acquisition is working really well, that all the little fixes and bugs are good and clean. And then I want to you know, keep rolling out products um, as part of my team. So you know, for us, it's, it's just the first thing. And there's a lot more to happen, a lot more to work on. But it's a great way to, you know, to rocket ship us up. But I'm not going to be looking at sort of, you know, our download numbers and say, oh my God, like why don't we have a million users in a week? That that, that article was amazing. It, it'll be driven by just building an amazing product with viral hooks that really work and that people use. And that's, you know, sort of the the first thing I'm worried about right now. So it's the polish. Yeah, yeah. It's it, a very good point that that uh, the launch isn't the end. Right? Yeah. It might be the end yeah. of product uh, version one. Uh, but it's exactly. then the business begins. Then the business begins exactly. So what, exactly. what do you, what do you think about um, um, turning this into revenue? Uh, you know, I saw some of the comments around that, but is it something that you're thinking about right now, or is it in the back of your head, or is it like, you know, you see some opportunities for revenue with this? Yeah, I, I mean, so we we have begun, you know, we're in, in talks with um, some brands that where we think there could be real revenue opportunity. But to be honest, I don't want to do anything to compromise our user experience. And I'm just really focused on engagement. And actually, I think you know our revenue opportunities will actually come from extracting real value from the consumers as opposed to just trying to put ads in. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's a platform for brands to launch products. You could create a track for Reebok and have you know, all the pictures of a sneaker line come into one track in a private place, and then you could go ahead and launch the product through that story, right? Yep. It makes a ton of sense. Yep. But, you, you know, in terms of revenue and extracting value, I think print could be very interesting. It's a really high margin business. We have a bunch of print providers that are looking to do deals with us. Um, and the second is, I think, you know, there's the ability to make custom themes and develop a whole theme store around the tracks so that each track is different and that story is told in a different way. Mm -hmm. But my number one focus right now is engagement. Uh, engagement, then adoption, then revenue. You, you know, you, it's sort of like you build a network, you grow the network, scale the network, and then you monetize the network. I don't want to you know, sort of just tack on a revenue thing a few months down the line or a few years down the line. I want it to be a natural part of the product itself. So we're going to figure it out as we go. But engagement is like by far the number one thing I'm concerned about. Uh, really interesting. Uh, yeah, you want it to feel. I think you, the 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 general tendency is to throw up banner ads, right? So on the website or or in the app or or do in app yeah. advertising. But you you know the beauty of the application is literally its beauty, right? So you want to make sure that what you're going to do is going to mimic the functions of of the application and not take people out of that experience or make it a, yeah. a, a inconvenient. But I can really see some great things. Um, that brands could use this very effectively uh, as uh, as even um, beautiful ads, shall we say? Yeah. Right, like car yeah. ads, uh, but it, in stills, right? And uh, anyway, I mean, you you guys. Exactly. Are... I mean, and you know, in terms of products, we actually 
we were working on an, uh, you know, an, a bunch of different sort of platforms, and one of the platforms that um, we're thinking about is iPad, mm -hmm. because you know, if you tell a story and that story is a track, putting it on iPad is going to look so amazing. Yeah, so there's a lot that you could do there. Yeah. Um, but again, we just want to build a really simple product and get it out there and get people using it. That's a, that's a great strategy. I mean, with the iPad, at least you can pull it up on the web site, right? You can pull it up yeah. on the web version. And, and uh, you, you know, that experience is, uh, you know, the iPad uh, browsing experience is, is drastically different than, than the iPhone browsing experience when it comes yeah. to the need of an app or not. Um, but, I mean, your strategy to choose iOS iPhone only. Um, yeah, that was that was really strategic to, to get it to the, into the most hands um, and uh, and focus on one platform at a time so you get that right. That was deliberate. Okay. I mean, and you know, Fred Wilson will probably throw throw a ball at me, but you know, I, and I realize that Android, you know, is it has a lot of market share now, and I guess if you know, probably are leading. I'm not sure if you add in the iPod touches how much they are leading, but if you look at media capture and consumption, the iPhone is way past any device. I mean, the stats that we, we ran were ridiculous. It was like 80% of iPhone users take at least one photo per week. Mm -hmm. That's completely insane, you know? You're, you're talking about billions of photos trapped in the photo library, uncurated and not in a storyboard format that you could take and put into a track. Yep. Like, it's just sick. And, and even though the camera, I think, is better on the Android, it doesn't matter. The photo taking experience on the iPhone, it just feels so natural. It's like made for that. So yeah, It's stupid proof, it, right? It was very deliberate yeah. in, in terms of why we went with iPhone. And, you know, we want to get on Android. It's our next big platform. So we will do that. Uh, but we want to make sure that this experience is nailed first. Yeah, I mean, I, there was a, a staggering statistic around Flickr that said the number one uh, camera type. Yeah. Is iPhone. Is the iPhone 4. Yeah, iPhone 4. It's iPhone 4, yeah. And if you just do iOS, it just blows everything away because you put in the 3GS in there and it's just sick. It's, it's insane. It didn't take long, right? And that's, and that's the beauty of this is that and whether or not uh, Android uh, ever becomes a dominant player in, in this, I mean, content consumption just alone is, is uh, you know, 88% 80, of content is consumed on an iOS device. So when you yeah. start to think about the implication, it's, I mean, right, right choice. Um, yeah, I, Fred Wilson, he's an interesting guy. I mean, he talked about implicit social graphs, and I think that that's what yeah. we're talking about, right? Uh, um, you, you know, and I think you were referencing that when you, you your original version of the product had, um, you know, you could follow locations. I could follow, as you said, like Hell's Kitchen, or I could follow Brooklyn, or I could follow uh, New Yankee Stadium. Right? Yeah, it was actually, it was more of you can, you can subscribe to a track that may contain those locations right, in them. Right. So it was you're subscribing to like a person's interest. That's amazing. Um, like my co-founder Trevor has a track called The Magic Hour. I don't know what this track means, <laughs> but I know in his life, every day it, it's The Magic Hour and yeah. he takes a photo. And I would subscribe to that track and every day I would see a photo coming in from The Magic Hour. Yeah. Uh, and that was like an interest graph that we were building um, on top of it. Um, so. It's it, I I love it and, and uh, you know one of the things that um, that we, we see especially when it comes to uh, the way that people use these devices is that it's it's certainly um, um, well I, I mean it's the iPhone is eating the the uh, camera industry whole yeah. as a result of this and and now it's about uh, my, my wife always says uh, you know I take hundreds of pictures of my kids playing t-ball doing everything around whatever it is I'm taking pictures of it in fact yeah. I'm looking for a reason to take a picture right. That's never yeah. happened before. And I think a lot of people are looking at that and they're like, hey, that looks arty. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take that yeah. picture. So I have literally thousands of photos. And then she says, she looks up at these empty frames all over the house and says, okay, well, how do they get there? Right? Yeah, yeah. And oh, my wife tells me the same exact thing. She's like, look at the photos in our apartment, right? <laughs> yeah. Look at how old those are. Exactly. All we have are photos from our wedding. Yeah. Just like seven years ago, yep. right? Because it's so hard to take it from mobile, from this device, take it all the way to the web and bring it back into the real world. And that's what, what Trax is trying to do, at least part one of what we're trying to do. And then, you know, you talk about sort of the implicit social graph. I mean, I think, you know, Trax is about the explicit graph, but the graph that you can't really capture through normal means like Facebook. Uh, so it's sort of like, it's a real world social network. I call it the micro social graph with interests that are layered on top of it. 
Yep. So instead of, and we were actually, I was talking to my co-founder, Trevor, about this um, the day after we launched, and he's like, you know, we're not really building a social network. We're building an archipelago. Yeah. Because what you have is a bunch of micro social networks that are forming around tracks constantly. They may or may not talk to each other, so they, they actually are an, an, an archipelago, and that's kind of how we interact in the real world, right? If you look at online social networks, the challenge that they've had with groups is that it's not architected for that. So like Facebook groups, if you look at the usage, half a percent of people actually create a Facebook group, and then to use that in the real world is really, really hard. Yeah. So from the ground up, Tracks is architected to support the notion of the micro-social graph, which I think is really powerful. Well, you know, I love it. And I keep coming back to a few examples of this, you know, where, where, where an application like this um, uh, really resonates. Because I always like to say, well, give me an example of something that, that would be use, a good use case for this. And, right. and I think of uh, Barack Obama being sworn in as president and CNN had this great thing where it said, take a picture if you're on the ground somewhere at, uh, at, at the ceremony. When he ra puts his hand on the Bible and raises his hand, his other hand, uh, everybody who's around take a picture from where you are. And they created this beautiful montage from, you know, basically it was like 3,000 views of that moment, capturing that point in history. And uh, I, I think about that and I think about what you're doing with tracks and it could be the exact same thing. Like you're at a, you know, a Springsteen show, you're at a hockey game, you're at a baseball game, a football game, a party, you're at a street party, uh, yeah. you know, whatever it is, you're capturing many, many angles of the exact same thing among the people that are there or you're sharing with. And it becomes a shared experience that you can then translate out into the web and into print. And uh, I think that's, it's pretty, it can be pretty powerful. And it can be very yeah, powerful. Yeah, yeah. And we think, I mean, if you think about our market, sort of the real-time event market that you're sort of talking about, right. it's a huge thing to go after, right? But we also think that tracks across space and time are really interesting, right? So when, it, when um, it's time for the holidays and New Year's, I have friends all across the world, from Africa to Europe to Asia oh, to North America, yeah. and I'm going to create a track for New Year's Eve, right? And all of them are going to just put photos in from wherever they are as the ball drops one time zone after another. Amazing. That's really, really powerful. So you have this sort of global track, right? And you could think of a whole bunch of different things. Well, even like a family one track. One time, you know? Yeah, like a family track. My family spread out. Why wouldn't I? Exactly. You know? Exactly. They always exactly. say that they never see pictures. So. Yeah, so not so worried about revenue right now, but always in the back of your head, you you, you know, yeah. as you're going through it, I mean, you're you're you know, you're pinning things on a wall to see if it if it if it'll work. Um, yeah. And you know, I love that iteration. Uh, I, I'm a big revenue guy. There has to be revenue at some point, but um, you you have to have the audience first for something like this. So you're funded then. That's that, that's the route that you're gonna go. Yeah. So we we raised a small seed round in the fall. Um, from Ed Sim at Bold Start Ventures, mm -hmm. um, and Daniel Klaus at App Fund, and ENIAC Ventures, which is the fund that I'm a partner in, also participated with some other angels as well. Um, and we've been keeping it pretty lean and mean, and we've gotten a ton of interest after our launch. So we're going to go out for a little round right now, probably Series A, um, and then really blow this thing out of the water. So let, let's talk about this. Um about this this New York scene that's developing and, and uh, you know as in my introduction of, of you uh, it seems like you're involved with this so you are a founding or co-founding partner of ENIAC Ventures which is uh, which is a venture capitalist that's invested in some yeah. of these uh, mobile companies um, mobile or web 2.0 companies right well ENIAC is a hundred percent focused on mobile okay so it's a core requirement um, the way we think about it, it's mobile seed stage and that's just a core requirement. We're the first independent mobile-only venture fund. All of the partners are entrepreneurs, so we run our own companies. This is something we do on the side. We've invested in about 16 companies to date, all mobile at the seed stage. Our whole thesis is there are a ton of businesses online that translate or have a, an offline or mobile component, and that's great. And then there are tons of businesses that are going to be built with mobile as the ground up. As the ground up. So, you know, in, in the first bucket, there's a lot of analytics companies mm -hmm. online, mm -hmm. and we're, we're invested in, in a mobile analytics company. There are ad networks online, we're invested in mobile ad networks. And that's, that's great. But our real interest, and I think the things we're really excited about, are the ones that really use the mobile sort of device 
for what it's really good at. You know, things that use GPS and camera um, and all the other uh, things that relate to the form factor of mobile uh, are really, really exciting for us. So, so you, you raised a fund just to, to, to do, uh, I mean, what size are the investments that you're doing in those companies? Or so we do, we do pretty small investments yeah. uh, at the size of angels, yep. but we do it as part of a larger round. Okay. Uh, and yeah, it is an LP fund. We raised an actual fund. You did? Yeah. Was that a, a, a long process? Um, we, we put it together pretty quickly. So I think the, the longer process was figuring out our strategy. You know, we, we, we knew that the four of us had wanted to work together. We're all engineers from Penn, hence the name ENIAC. It's, mm -hmm. It was the first uh, computer. It was, in, it was yeah. invented at Penn. And so we're like, we want to put this fund together. I had come from a venture capital background with our ventures and Nahal, who's my partner, is a serial entrepreneur in the mobile space. Hadley does consumer at Flingo, which is a which yep. is a mobile startup. And Tim Young's a venture lawyer in the mobile space as well. He did deals with Sequoia and Kleiner and whatnot. So we said we want to do this fund, and we need to really think hard and strong about where the markets are going to be and how we can help companies. So this is you know our strategy and our thesis that we came up with, um, and then we put it together pretty well. Uh, and or, or, or pretty quickly, actually. So, I mean, I think it's great. And are, are all the companies that you've got in there? They're all New York based. We have, I think, the majority of the companies are New York. We have a couple companies in Boston and a few companies out west. We like to stay close to our companies, um, and New York clearly is a natural fit with everything that's going on here. Hadley Harris, who runs, who's one of my partners. He's in Boston, so at least he's feet on the street there. Yeah. He comes to New York every week as well. And Tim Young is out in the Valley, so we have coverage there as well. But New York really is our home base. Well, so, uh, I mean, what's the challenge for you? Is it kind of schizophrenic being being a part of uh, ENIAC? Um, even though you are full-time, as you said, 150% of your time is, is spent on tracks now. Uh, yeah. And I'd, I'd wager that it's actually more than that. Um, yeah. yeah. yeah if, if you split a day, there's probably 28 hours a day on, uh, <laughs> on tracks. Um, do you find, do you find um, I mean, is it a distraction with the, the shiny new toys? You know, some of these, some of the people coming at you like with some really amazing ideas that you, that you yeah. want to get involved with. But, you know, you got to focus on, you got to focus on what you're doing with tracks. Is that, is that a big challenge? Yeah, it is. I mean, it, but it's it's worked out quite nicely so far. So, you know, I'm a big believer that you will be a better investor if you're an entrepreneur, yeah. especially in that space, and vice versa. You're a better entrepreneur if you're an investor. So I think it works out really well because a lot of these companies that I talk to, I may end up doing business with anyway for tracks, mm -hmm. right? So there's synergies there. And, and when I talk to them as an investor, they can tell immediately that I'm in the trenches with them, right? I'm talking about consumer acquisition and product strategy and adoption and engagement and all the things an entrepreneur should be talking about. So when they talk to us, they're like, oh, wow, this guy or, you know, or these guys are actually in the trenches and running companies. So it's also a natural fit. So I think it's actually working out pretty nicely. I, I love that. And, I, you know, we've alluded to this many times. Most of these companies are New York based. Um, I, you know, I spoken with Nearverse, Fast Society, a bunch of other ones that are all New York based, including Daily Grape and a bunch of other, uh, you know, great little mobile companies. Um, what is it about New York? Is it what, what's going on there over the last couple of years? Um, I don't know if anybody has an answer, but, you know, the the technology, uh, it seems like the pendulum has swung from the West Coast. I mean, it's picked up steam quite substantially in the West Coast, but, you know. Yeah. But it's swinging over to places like New York, Austin, Boston. Uh, you know what? What? What happened? All of a sudden, New York yeah. is a, is a hub of software activity in the mobile. Yeah, space. it's pretty crazy, right? It's really, really insane. I think um, I think you know all the brands are here, and, and Madison Ave is here, so it's really accessible. When I was at Nearverse, I would go over to MTV, you know, <laughs> at eight in the morning and have breakfast with these guys. It was a block away from my apartment, um, so I think you have all the brands being here. And then you have you know this massive spike in entrepreneurship because people are just fleeting away from finance, right? Yeah. Either if you're a new college grad, we've talked to so many new college grads that are saying, I want to work at a startup and then I want to start my own company. <laughs> I don't want to do banking. I'm like, wow, that's amazing because the sort of the, um, the mindset around it has completely changed. 
Um, and I think it happened because of everything with the Great Recession and whatnot. People came out of there and said, hey, I really want to just do my own thing. Yeah. And also, I think it's sort of like a fever, right? So if you're, if, if you're like a smart young guy and you're thinking about your next thing and you see all these other guys who you kind of respect and they're all out starting companies and mobile and whatnot, you're like, you know what? I'm going to get that fever. I'm going to give it a shot too. And it kind of just goes on and on and on from there. So, and I think it does start at kind of at the more experienced guys, right? The guys who've been around the block a lot yeah. and, you know, are, are mentoring all the young entrepreneurs coming up and that just spreads itself all the way around. I think it's fantastic. That's, that's a really great point. Two, two questions to finish up here is that just around, I only had one, but you just opened up the second one here, uh, yeah. around mentoring because, you, you know, there's a, there's a, a perception out there that mobile is a, like this generation of entrepreneur is, um, is independent and doesn't need that kind of gray haired mentoring and gray hair. I mean like 30 and older, you know, it's perspective. Yeah. Um, I have my first gray hair actually that okay, I got. You, just, call, just you qualify <laughs> 16 investments, a couple of startups under your belt. Yeah. Yeah. It's all right. <laughs> um, but how important is that mentoring from, from, uh, you know, from, from people who have gone through this, even like I look at, at Mark Andreessen, right. Um, and JJ and Jeremy Allaire, these guys that were the dot com guys that really did well. And now they're out there spreading that knowledge to a lot of new companies that, that are benefiting from it. How important is that? Yeah, I think it's critical. It's absolutely critical. One, it's critical in the mobile ecosystem. So me and my partners have seen the notion of wireless turn into mobile, yes. right? Yes. So if you go to CTIA now, you have you, you can immediately see these guys are wireless guys. These guys are mobile guys. Yeah. There's completely two different things, but we've always been in mobile. I mean, yeah. and we've always been mobile guys. Yep. And so having all these relationships that we have and seeing the ecosystem just play out from the time the iPhone launched to now in the day of the smartphone, it's just been incredible. Um, and then I think, so there's sort of the domain part that we help the, the, the young entrepreneurs with, but there's also sort of like just company building, right? You know, sort of like, how do you get a team around you? How do you sort of look at your product and then right. throw it away right. and then go back again. How do you raise capital, right? And how do you go back to the market again to raise capital? How do you do all these things while trying to find your, 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 your fit, right? So, it, and it's not easy, it's really, really hard. But the one thing that we say when we look at companies is, you have to have a technical co-founder. We don't care how young or how old you are, it doesn't matter to us as long as you're willing to take our advice. And we're not gonna be pushy about it, we'll totally help you out. And I think it's really worked well. Um, we have you know, a ton of companies who we advise all the time, you know, whether it's fun fundraising or strategy or whatnot. And it's really, really starting to pay off for these guys. Yes, yeah, I love that. And, and I, you, know, you brought up that point about a technical uh, co-founders. It, that's just, uh, just because of logic? Uh, yeah, like you know, to expand on that, there's you know, on the technical co-founder and then the young or old. Like we have you know, a couple companies where I've, we were told, oh, the, that person or the CEO isn't a business person, right? And we're like, well, you know what that CEO has done? They've gotten a technical co-founder to quit their job <laughs> and got two other developers to come join them and work for free. Yeah. I don't yeah. care if they don't know finance, they're a leader yeah. and that's a CEO and that's all that matters. Yeah. Um, so that's why, like, so that's a big reason why we look for a technical co-founder because it shows the CEO's ability to grab talent and to inspire leadership. And, and number two is, who's gonna build it? It can't be built, I mean, even if it's a simple app, we just are not believers in outsourcing that stuff. Yeah. We've just seen it time and time again, and it just never works out. Um, and ideas are a dime a dozen, right? As I, as I showed you with, with tracks, we started with one thing, and we're, we're kind of in a different direction. So it's all about execution. So yes. hacker, hustler, designer, man. Hacker, hustler, New designer. Mantra. <laughs> that uh, well, I mean, absolutely, and, and uh, throw in some ramen noodles, and your uh, and and that's yeah. the team right there, the team and the diet. Yeah. Last last question, just around investment in right. general. Um, so as you said, we've, we've just come out of a, a pretty steep, deep uh, cut wound on the global economy, right? Uh, I think yeah. we're slowly coming out of this um, slowly, um, but there is a lot of investment available out there, isn't there? I mean, for good ideas, because it doesn't take a lot of money. To build it doesn't take 40 or 50 million dollars although some yeah. companies think but what um, I mean, are you seeing that are you seeing a lot of dollars available for good ideas yeah I think so I mean just at the macro level 
we are in a part of the economy that's taking off right now. Yeah. So the perspective that we have compared to someone in other industries is very different. Like I have friends in other industries and they're dying, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm just so optimistic about entrepreneurship and startups in America. So it's just absolutely amazing to see. But on top of it, I do think there's a lot of capital available to really good entrepreneurs, right? Like the idea is is important, but it's the team, and that's that's what it comes down to. When we write checks, we say, "Hey, do we believe in this guy that when push comes to shove, he's not going to quit and he's going to come up with something else and and make it work?" Yeah. And and I think there's a lot of capital available for those kind of people. Yeah, well, that's what we're seeing. I mean, I think in Canada, which is where I am, it's not as uh, we don't have that feeling. I think that in cities like, at least in my city, but in Toronto, in Montreal, in Vancouver, we're starting to see that. But I don't see anything like I see in, in uh, New York and, and the Bay Area. Um, I haven't yeah, seen anything like I that. Just exactly. Putting my investor hat on, you know, um, a lot of the West Coast VCs and angels are looking at New York big time. And, and they're looking to partner with New York-based funds because... They need that feet on the street. Yeah. Every big name VC on the West Coast now has some kind of presence here, official or unofficial. Right. Um, and it's just, it's happening. It's, it's, it's that time again for us. I love it. I love it. So, uh, I mean, a lot of cross-pollination, a lot of great little ideas. Um, and again, these are small bets compared to what we were making uh, 10 or 12 years ago uh, in terms of revenue. $200,000 in the right company, fifty grand with the right founder yeah. uh, can do wonders right now. It's, yeah, it's insane. And my first startup, I was about 24 years old and the company had raised $300 million in venture capital in 1999. <laughs> it was ridiculous. They had like the 25th floor to on One Liberty Plaza perpetually leased, just nice. dumping cash out the window. So I can't even imagine. I mean, that's- $300 million. $300 million. Yeah, yeah, insane. I don't even know what I-, I... <laughs> I don't even know. I don't even know what. I, I don't even know how to respond to that. I mean, exactly. It, exactly. it seemed normal back then, didn't it? It seemed normal. It seemed normal. Some companies have raised, uh, you know, a billion dollars. But so, uh, I mean, I, you know, Vic, I, I can monopolize your entire day here. Uh, totally, yeah. totally uh, appreciate you doing this. Uh, let, let's get back to tracks very quickly. Uh, where can people find out more information about tracks? Yes. Yeah, so please go check out tracks.io is our URL. Yeah. Um, and just go to the app store and download the app to search for tracks. Um, and feel free to email me. I'm Vic at Tracks IO. Oh, that's so, perfect. Yeah. So do we're that. gonna buy the dot com, but we're lean and mean. We can't, you know, spend a, a twenty grand or so to buy the dot com just yet. <laughs> that's right, that's right. We couldn't afford it. So <laughs> Tracks it, <you> IO. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's it's interesting. I think I saw a study about uh, TechCrunch disrupt uh, tech, tech crunch disrupt companies, and and uh, twenty five of them were dot coms, and and there, you know there was only one dot io. So uh, you know you stood out there, didn't you? Yeah. Well, we're all about the input and the output, right? The mobile phone's the input, and the yeah. web and the print are the output. Uh, I love it. So that's tracks.io. Go to iTunes, download the application, just do a search for tracks. Uh, you'll find it. I've got it. Um, and uh, you can you can reach Vic at uh, Vic at tracks.io and follow them on Twitter. Do everything that you can. Uh, I know that uh, you're going to really appreciate it. I've been playing around with this. If I could just find some friends, um, I think that I would uh, I would be able to experience this, experience this a great a little deeper. Yep. Awesome. awesome. Vic, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you coming on and, and doing this. It's been very, I mean, it's been an exceptional conversation. Um, I know that the people watching and listening would have found tremendous value in this. Uh, so thank you, Vic, for doing this. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Take care. And for those of you who are still watching and listening, thank you guys. I love the fact that you're still there. I love the fact that you do this every episode. And I, what I love even more, if you'd give me some feedback at untether at gmail.com, reach out to Vic, reach out to me. We'll see you next time. This has been another episode of untether.tv.